Sub Shredders, my name is Logan, aka Spider Hands, and welcome to the 26th SB interviews. Where today we are chatting to an act named Limnetic Villains. And if we switch over to here, well, we're doing an audio based interview today with Limnetic Villains, which is all good. Limnetic, feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm the Limnetic Villains from Ireland, and uh, I make music. And uh, what kind of music do you make? Um, so I suppose it's kind of ulti, electro, somewhat gothic in some ways music. It's kind of a primal screamy in some places. I've heard some people describe it like that. Um, it's really hard to describe your own music, and I'm sure everyone has the same problem. But uh, yeah, it's it's danceable. I, I try and make it danceable. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I've got, and I'll show you band camp in, 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 in this part of the interview, just because you've got like 11, 11 releases, dude. And I've actually got them. Like I went and purchased them myself because I really enjoy your music. Um, what's the journey been like making all this? So it's happened over quite a long period of time. I started making music when I was about 15 and I'm in my early thirties now. Um, so I suppose I've been doing it for just over more than half my life. Um, and when I first started doing it, I was on a small little record label. Um, I think they were based in Holland. Um, Rack and Ruin Records was their name. And uh, I was just kind of messing around really. I wasn't thinking about it um very much at all and it's only since the pandemic happened that i've really been pushing it out there so i've been making music for for years for yeah just over 15 16 years now and um when i first started doing it it was kind of a mess is the best way i can describe it i was playing around on untuned guitars and just recording straight into a microphone input and then slowly over the years i've kind of started trying to hone things a bit more the first uh, album on Bandcamp was done in 2013. So I probably made that during like 2012, most of that. And um, each album I've tried to kind of hone a single sound for each album. But uh, I, I, I don't really know exactly what's coming out until it's there. So I'll, I'll make, you know, 30, 40 tracks and then maybe 10 of them will go together. And then I'll try and make another two or three to kind of get the album together in one thing. But uh, as far as it goes, I kind of just make things and then put them together. Wow. I can't imagine how you'd get that much material like written to then cut it down. Like, how do you get through these tracks so quickly? I really don't think about it. A lot of the, a lot of the tracks that you'll hear, um, I did them in the space of a day or two. And I'll just, I'll just do them. Um, I don't think about it too much. Um, not to say that it's brain dead, but there isn't, an unbelievable amount of thought i'll be honest when i'm making these things um i want to make something that i can move around to um that's kind of really i suppose the driving factor there oh no absolutely i mean like you know you talk about needing that quarter note groove there right and i think you're absolutely right because you've got some really you know you talked about primal scream stuff before you've got some really interesting textures in this that can kind of be sort of visceral listen to but it's really cool how you managed to tie it together and, and keep that pulse going, you know? Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's the one thing that comes into my head when I try and talk, talk about music is, um, is that f famous quote that no one knows who said it. First of all, it was um, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. I don't know if you've heard that. And I kind of really feel like it is like that because when you're making music or when you're putting it out there, or if you're doing something live with a band, that's one thing, it's kind of organic. You, you can just do it, I suppose. I know there are different processes that everyone has. Some people, they'll make music and they'll think about it a lot, but I really don't think about it too much. I just do it. Do you feel that that's the best way to do it? Uh, well, again, I suppose everyone's different. You know, there'll be some people who will they'll procrastinate over a track for, for months and they'll hone every sound and that's fantastic. And everyone has their own different processes. Some people will, you know, really try and hone a certain style and sound. Um, whereas I suppose it's like that. Uh, who's that? There's a guy called Ed Wood who just threw films together. And sometimes I feel a li little bit like him. I I'll just make something. And if it sounds good, it sounds good. If it sounds terrible, I'll scrap it. But, uh, you know, I might do two, two or three tracks a day. And um, with the pandemic happening, it's given me a lot of free time because uh, I'm a photographer. So I basically, since the pandemic happened, I haven't been working. So I've just been making music all the time. Oh, I'm really, I'm genuinely sorry to hear that. I, I'm not sure what the pandemic has been like in, in your part of the world, because where are you based at the moment? 
Well, I'm in Ireland, um, and when the pandemic happened, I moved further into the countryside. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere, which is really fantastic. Um, but yeah, the pandemic has been strange. I, I was in college and finishing my final year when it happened, when it first hit. And uh, strangely, it was beneficial in some ways because um, the end of the college year was a lot easier. But yeah, I suppose the, the amount of time freed up has been very helpful in that way. Um, the pandemic has been horrible and it still is. And I'm still being really careful. I know a lot of people kind of think it's over now. And yeah, it's a strange situation for everyone in the whole world. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I really do hope things improve for you soon. I'm glad you managed to get into the countryside. Like, do you feel like moving to the countryside by itself has been more of a peaceful environment to make music in? It's definitely a peaceful environment, yeah. Um, it's nice basically being able to make loud music as well because before I'd be in a situation where I was sitting down with a laptop on a sofa trying to kind of whisper vocals, you know, not to disturb anyone else. And um, in some ways, that probably informed some of the sound on some of the previous albums. Yeah, because like, I have to admit, yeah, I can hear that. I can actually hear that a little bit because I listen to releases, um, you know, I listen to releases like the an electronic syncing EP, and it did sound like you were coming into it, but to hear you were actually having to be quiet for the sake of consideration of others is actually really interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's not really something that I've thought about too much, but yeah, I was definitely... And a few of my earlier things being very quiet because I didn't want to disturb other people. <laughs> I mean, like, to, to be fair, I think there were some tracks that were instrumental because you, you don't sing on every track, do you? No. I've been uh, trying to do some more singing recently, but um, a lot of my previous music, I was making instrumental tracks. Yeah, because I was just thinking, shit, I sound really stupid then. Because I do remember an electronic syncing didn't actually have that many vocals in it, did it? No, I don't think it did. Cool, it, sweet. It was like... Yeah, there's like three EPs, and I think they're mainly electronic. Cool. Like, I'm just kind of getting over the fact, I suppose, that you were in a record label when you started out, right? At the age of 15, is that correct? Yeah, um, I was about, I was probably about 17 when I got on the record label, but it was a, it was an online record label. It wasn't really, it wasn't a money maker. It wasn't really anything but for fun. And sadly, the record label went defunct, and all of their stuff is just gone off the internet now. So what do you do in that situation? Like, how did you do the royalty splits and stuff like that? I don't think there was any. They were just put on there for free and everyone could just download them. I mean, I suppose this was, this was kind of just before it was really easy to get distrib distribution the way it is now. Now you can just go on DistroKid and pay 20 quid or 30 quid or whatever it is. And uh, you can put your music everywhere. And the streaming platforms haven't even really developed too much back then. So this is what, 15, 16 years ago, it was only just kind of starting to turn that way. And you basically, I'd give them my music and they'd zip it in a file and they'd just give it out and then anyone could download it, which was kind of nice. And I made, I made one friend off there. Um, his name is uh, Billy and uh, he makes music from Ireland as well. And like, you know, he just put his music on there and there's lots of strange music, really, really weird, bizarre left field stuff. And I suppose a lot of stuff that would now be considered vaporwave. Yeah, yeah. Vaporwave is one of those genres where um, it's almost like being weird has sort of become fashionable, fashionable music nowadays. I suppose it has. Yeah, people are trying to be unusual. Maybe that means they're not unusual. I'm not sure. Do you? Where, do, where did you get started before all this though? Like, did you get education through school or did private stuff? Or I played the piano when I was a kid, um, so I got a few piano lessons. But uh, apart from that. We had like an upright piano in the house. Apart from that, um, my uncle introduced me to, uh, I think it was Sony Acid. I think it was just before Acid became Sony. I think it was like Sonic Foundry maybe. And that was like really early. And then there was Fruity Loops. I think it was the second version of Fruity Loops. So I had them when I was a kid. And then I just messed around with them really. And then I got a guitar and I started playing around on that. And I'm still terrible on guitar, to be honest. But um yeah, so I, I just kind of messed around and it organically happened. I taught myself. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose the great thing is, though, as well with tutorials and things, you can learn a lot online. I, I think with your guitaring, though, like if I'm not mistaken, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, I think Stay Hydrated off your most recent release, Logic Collapses, did they have some guitar in it? If I can remember. <laughs> um, I think it did. I think it yeah. did. I, I do play guitar, but um, I'd say that I, I play it very basically. 
And I also play it in a quite unusual way. I untune my guitars and I tune them to bar chords. And then I basically play around threes. So like three frets. And then you can do that across the entire guitar if you've tuned it into one bar chord, which is fine for one song. But if you were doing something live, you would not be able to do it. You you know, and if a, an actual real guitarist gives me that guitar, they hate me because I untune it, I give it back to them and they can't do anything on it. <laughs> Guitarists hate him. <laughs> but, yeah, it, 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 it reminds you that man. I lo I love that. But the thing is, like you you might have done some basic stuff on Stay Hydrated, but it suited the mood of the track, though, in my opinion. Cheers. Yeah. Um. I mean, like, I guess I I I try and I've taught myself to do all this stuff, but uh, I'm definitely not a trained musician. And when it comes to production, I like to think that I've improved a lot and I've got decently good at it but um I haven't had any teaching um I, I suppose I've been in a lot of music studios though um as a photographer because I'd be taking pictures of bands and I used to do that for like maybe 10 years before I went to college so I've been going around the like Dublin music scene and I've been invited into studios so I've got to see a lot of music production techniques um, and I've got to learn a lot just from being in the same room and in, in recording studios, a lot of people think it might be exciting, but it's mostly really, really, really dull. And a lot of people are just kind of sitting around the bands annoyed, you know, the bassist is like, oh God, the guitarist is doing his part for like 20 takes and I have to be quiet <laughs> in the corner. And the drummer's like, oh, I want to go and get drunk and, <laughs> you know. So music studios are quite boring. And if you're in there as a photographer, you have to be completely silent. So most of the time, if you're not taking pictures of people, you're kind of just observing. And then I ended up just looking at what they were doing. And you'd learn a few little things here and there. Oh, yeah, look, mate. <laughs> like, I'm sure it is a shame that it has to be like that in studios. Typically, you'll get the bands that go in there and um, they haven't practiced enough. So that's when you get those 20 takes. Occasionally, you'll get bands that go in and out like super quick. But usually, it's that one musician, right? They go in there and they're like, oh, yeah, totally. I'll just make up the solo. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that works. Sometimes it works really well. Like improvisations, absolutely. Don't get me wrong. I love improvisations. Um, it's just for people like yourself who have to sit there quietly whilst they figure out which like kind of mode they're going to use or if they're going to do taps or sweeps. It's I, I get it, man. It's a it's a it's a it's a lesson in patience, isn't it? It is a massive lesson in patience. With your music that you do, have there been themes that have resounded throughout? Because I remember you saying you had tried to make a certain sound for each album. Um, so there's a few kind of, I suppose, so um, Pump and Dump is one of my releases. I think it was like two albums ago now. And that one is actually kind of, the idea was a concept album about NFTs actually because I really hate NFTs. I hate the whole idea of it. I think they're a massive con. Um, you know, I feel sorry for some people who get involved with that. And the whole pump and dump thing is to kind of to do with cryptocurrency and, you know, basically bringing the stock up and then selling it. And then I guess they call it a rug pull, right? That album was kind of going to be a concept album about that. And I wouldn't say that the songs themselves have much to do with it. it it's more like the album title does and maybe the timing as well um because i think a week or two before that a load of my friends off twitter and some other places they had their uh, their music stolen and sold as nfts oh yeah it was pretty bad and uh so they were all talking about that and then i noticed now this wasn't a direct selling of my music but an nft streaming website um, took some of my music and what they were doing is that they were sending bots to Spotify and they were basically just, I don't know if they were streaming it from Spotify or doing some sort of ripping of albums, but I noticed that some of my music was up there too. So that really annoyed me. So I was like, right, do something to do with that. And, uh, so that was kind of a loose concept. I think, so my last album is uh, logic collapses and I was kind of trying to get a bit sci-fi with that. Um, so for the album artwork, I got one of my friends, Marcella, to do that. And that's the first time I've got someone else to do the album artwork because I've always done the rest of it. So that was kind of loosely based on, I guess, sci-fi themes. And I think there's maybe a little bit of dystopian sci-fi 
kind of Blade Runner-y stuff going through some of my music. There's so much stuff I want to talk about. I want to talk about the NFT stuff, but also I feel like Logic Collapse is, is such a good choice after Pump and Dump because you're watching people pump and dump and then you realize that you're just giving up on humanity <laughs> at that point, so Logic Collapses. Um, what is why, why is music being streamed on NFT websites? Well, I think that they're trying to get the the numbers up. I, I know that um, basically it's kind of like a, as far as I can tell, they're just trying to milk people. They're trying to get as many people involved in NFTs and trying to promote NFTs as a kind of ecosystem, a legitimate one. Um, and as far as I can tell, trying to stream music on their websites is a way to like go like, yeah, we're legitimate. Everyone is on here. That's as far as I can tell what's going on there. But it's not good though because you know it's dreadful if, if you hate nfts and your music is being used to try and promote nfts it's it's ridiculous that's what i think well they're stealing it yeah spotify doesn't like bots playing songs it doesn't spotify will sh i mean spotify I, th I think and this is a very risky take i'm gonna take say here i i did a track with another musician over in los angeles a while back and i'm like I'm certain that there may have been some clicks paid for on their behalf. And what happened okay. was is that I went and checked on their profile and they don't have a Spotify account anymore. I think that Spotify, if you get enough bot clicks, actually does shut down accounts because it interprets them as being paying for clicks. And what happens if an NFT website gets enough clicks on an unwitting artist's Spotify account does that artist get shut down even if they literally had nothing to do with it? Yeah, that's dangerous. Can you take it down? Like, is there any way to remove, like, stop them from doing that? I can't remember the name of the thing now off my hand. And I wouldn't even say it if I did remember it because I wouldn't want to bring any attention to them. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, I remember, I just remember seeing it. And then there was a few of them as well. It wasn't just one. And this is probably still happening now. But yeah, that, that's that's happening, and it's it's pretty dangerous for everyone who's in the like, especially smaller artists. I'm, I'm assuming that the bigger ones will get away with their bot clicks, uh, I guess. Well, yeah, if you're a bigger artist, and then like a tiny percentage, or even like ten percent of your percent, you know, is 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 bots, and ninety percent is organic. Spotify probably isn't going to care, but Spotify, you know, like they're on 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 certain websites, you can like pay for like X amount of thousand plays, right? Um, I wouldn't personally do this because I think it's garbage, but I've had people admit on live stream interviews. I've had people admit in interviews to paying for clicks. Mm -hmm. And like, I think it's just so easy and so tempting for, for younger artists or newer artists who maybe think they can get away with it, right? And then what happens is that they get shut down for it or they get away with it, are incentivized, and then they do it enough times to get, <laughs> to get shut down for it. Um, but I'm glad to hear that you're not into that, dude. I'm glad to hear you've got some authenticity. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I've got less than, I don't know, 60 or 70 listens a month on, on Spotify. I was even debating whether or not I should put that up. I only put stuff up on Spotify this year. Oh, well, I, no, I suppose last year now. Um, so yeah, 2021, I put stuff up on Spotify, but most of the times I, I've just been using Bandcamp to get my music out there and... I kind of feel like that's that's probably the most genuine. You know, you, you can give away albums on that, but, um, you know, you, you can see if people are, are listening to their music on that and you can see who buys it. And I, I think Bandcamp is probably the best. I know that they've just been bought by a, a larger company. So hopefully that doesn't change. Yeah, hopefully it doesn't change. Um, you know, I think there's... there's I, I, I say this with fingers crossed i think there's a few too many like people who are really comfortable with it you know really comfortable with what Bandcamp is doing at the moment that if they changed it it'd cause an absolute shitstorm. so i'm sure that you guys will be fine because it's it's cool that you just have everything you've made on that yeah most most of it yeah <laughs> uh, for one point i had um five thousand tracks last count five thousand tracks done that was a ridiculous amount, and a lot of them were terrible. This is over, like, I guess, 15 years, right? Um, I was making, like, a song a day for a while, and I lost a load of them last year during some, like, virus crash on an old laptop. 
but if I had all my music out there, it would be so terrible that no one would want to listen to it. There has to be some kind of quality control, you know? Oh, definitely, because once you upload something to the internet, it's difficult to take it off. Mm. You know, like, if you have control over every single facet of your distribution and you can literally just press a button that removes it straight away, then you've got full control. But, um... Yeah, I'm glad that you've put your best stuff on there. It's great, man. Like, cause, cause I've noticed with your Bandcamp, it says donating everything I sell on Bandcamp Fridays to cancer research, which, but, which is fucking awesome, dude. That's really cool. Tell us more about that. So yeah, after I finished college and the pandemic had hit, I was just sort of sitting around and I hadn't really pushed my music anywhere really for a long time. You know, since that free record label thing. Um, fizzled out like I guess sometime in like 2012 or 2013 I hadn't really been doing much with my music at all so then the pandemic hit and I was sitting around thinking what can I do I couldn't work my plan was after college to finish to be a wedding photographer not that that's my dream job or anything but uh, it was just a way to pay the bills you know so I was thinking what can I do I want to do something good and I was like I make music all the time I might as well try and do something good with it so you know, the cancer research thing. So I, I raise it for the Irish Cancer Society. Um, I basically give them everything. And um, it's been really good. Um, my grandmother died of cancer when I was 12 years old. And she basically helped raise me. So it's it's kind of a cause that's pretty close to my heart. And, you know, I, I'd like to do more, I guess. Um, but that's kind of the little bit that I can do at the moment. And uh, yeah. Oh, look, I'm, I'm sorry if you're lost, man. She sounds like an amazing woman. Um, you obviously turned out all right. <laughs> so, Just about. <laughs> that's a unique thing that you're doing. I've done probably well over a thousand of these reviews now, and I have not come across someone who actually donates their proceeds to anyone aside from themselves. So congratulations. <laughs> I noticed that there are a few people that do this with Bandcamp, actually, which is, is really nice to see. There's actually quite a lot of people raising money for um, homeless shelters and different causes. I've seen a few in Scotland. Um, so it, it has become a thing. I think those Bandcamp Fridays have actually helped that along quite a bit. But yeah, most people try and make money for themselves. And it's understandable. You know, musicians notoriously do not get paid throughout, you know, whether it's live gigs and they get paid like in beer or, you know, sometimes people pay money to play venues and i think that's disgraceful to be honest and there is a fine line between you know making art and trying to put something out of yourself and trying to make money at the same time and it's a difficult thing for everyone i, I think and it's it's even harder for anyone who's creative wait did you just say that people pay to play venues yeah sometimes i've seen it um just before uh just before i started messing around with the record label online I was in a small little band, like teenagers. I was a singer in some little, we were kind of like a indie blues band. And uh, there was a guy famously in Dublin and he used to go around making teenagers sell the tickets to his own gigs. And he'd take the money from all of the ticket sales. And he did that for years and he made a lot of money off it. And then also taking pictures of bands I'd see bands going and doing gigs and they do like an hour set and they might get paid 50 quid or they get paid in just beer. That's brutal, dude. <laughs> like how are you supposed to be out? Because I mean, like when I did cover shows and stuff like that, because I used to do cover gigs, right? Used to do cover gigs. Um, we got paid like $400 a night for like three and a bit hours work, right? So that's about, that was about a hundred bucks per person for three hours, which is like, but it was better than nothing, right? But the idea of someone having to sell tickets or to pay for a venue is kind of wild to me you haven't had to do any of that stuff though have you no like we did one gig when we were teenagers we did one gig for this guy who wanted us to sell the tickets and um it's pretty funny really because oh, i was just like i'm not doing that you know uh, we're all teenagers who's gonna buy it? he's gonna buy it first of all i think i was had like 20 quid a week pocket money you know and it's like, yeah, can I sell this to my friend? No, they're not going to buy it. And uh, my other friends tried to sell some tickets, and I think they sold like two tickets. So we get to the venue, and we give the guy his tickets back. And he's like, what, you didn't sell me? And we're like, no. 
<laughs> no, we didn't. And there was another band there playing, and they hadn't sold any tickets either. So we were in a room playing to the other band, and these two pe- people who, these poor little other uh, uh, teenage sods who paid the money. And then after we finished the gig, we left. So the poor other band was just playing on their own. Ooh. And that's not nice as well. Like I, I wish, I wish we had stayed, but we we actually had to go because those parents picking us up to go grab all the gear, you know. Oh, that's fine. I mean, not that I'm going to tell you how to live your life, but it, like when you're a teenager, you you got rules, man. You you got you got parents to consider, you know. And you know, like if you're no, getting rides, if you, if you do a gig, I would. If you do a gig, I advise to stick around with the other bands. It's 100%. real bad form if you don't stick around, eh? Real bad form. Yeah, no. But but it's okay. Like, I don't consider what happened with you to be a situation like that. You just needed to go because of, like, parents and stuff like that. It's not like you should... I don't, I don't personally think you should feel bad, but obviously you feel free to do what you... <laughs> you feel free to, to do what you band, want. I think the other band was probably happy. They just used it as a practice session. And we did too. I mean, that was a joke gig. That was ridiculous. But I suppose, like, have you done the other shows? So I was, um, pl- I was singing for another band for a little while. We just did one or two songs. They were kind of getting in musicians to just uh, different singers. They're called Restive Nation. So they've played all over Dublin. And then I've played around with a few other little bands. So I've played quite a few venues in Dublin. And I like it, but I don't think that I'd probably do my music as it currently is live. It'd be quite hard to do on my own. And... Uh, Another weird thing about that is like, so all the drums on my albums, um, a lot of that would be stuff that I recorded when I had access to a drum kit years ago. And I took samples from the kits. And then some of it as well is Logic Drummer. Um, some of it's programmed. So to try and do that live, it would just look very strange, I think, if I was just playing on a laptop. So I'd probably need to get a band together if I wanted to do something live. So I've kind of been avoiding that. There's some interesting bits of information there because I, I was aware that you did some drums. I mean, if you look at your Limnetic Villains band camp, you got yourself on the drums. Did you say you sampled your own kit? Yeah, well, sometimes my own kit and then sometimes other people's. Um, so go and find a musician, you know, or go to... Actually, when I was taking pictures of a lot of bands, I'd be in their practice rooms and they'd go for a break and then I'd uh, just put out a little Zoom thing and then record some drums. And I did that for years and then, you know, slowly built up a massive big file of drums. And so I dip into that every now and then and just take little pe- bits and pieces every now. Oh, that's perfect. That's so clever because you've basically got yourself your own drum library now and you know it's good because it's your own stuff. Yeah, it's good and terrible. It's great. <laughs> I've listened to your stuff though, man. Honestly, I, I mean, it's not like, because I'm a drummer myself, you know. I listen to your stuff and I think, man, this guy plays the drums. It's so nice to hear someone actually playing the drums, you know? It's Again, though, it is a mixture of stuff. Like, there'll be some stuff on there that sounds like I'm playing the drums. And it's just really, really, I suppose, um, doctored to sound like it's it's live. So there's a little bit of that in there, too. Well, I mean, the fact that I can't tell is just you getting you're pretty good at your production chops at this point do you do you still use fruity loops 2.0 or have you advanced beyond fruity loops at this point <laughs> yeah i'm a little bit beyond that I'm, I'm so i use logic um and so i use logic i also got recently i've been getting into sense quite a lot probably a bit too much i've become a bit of a gearhead so i've got um i've got a few cheap synths. i got like the behringer crave and i've got the uh micro freak and I've got the Uno, which is a really weird one. I'm trying to think who that, that's IK Multimedia. They brought out a synth called the Uno. And they're all kind of cheap little boutique synths and they work really well. And then I've bought a load of guitar effects pedals as well. So I've been kind of building up a, a nice amount of gear. And then I think that's been kind of informing my sound a bit more as well, because for a long time I was using DSTs and, you know, they're good. They're, you can get some really amazing sounds. But using real instruments is it's just a step above, I think, in, in terms of playing anyway. Yeah, no. And I, I think that, pers- for me, in my opinion, that's something you learn through comparing the two. I feel like you can only really get a hang of the difference when you're able to play it. Do, do you know what I mean? When you actually play it versus mm-hmm. when you sort of try the VST version, you, you can usually hear the difference. Definitely when it comes to analog stuff as well, there is... There's something a bit more uh, gritty 
is the best word I think. Gritty and I don't know, warm. Uh, that's that's a term used a lot. It's it's you can get warm stuff from digital things as well, but uh, especially when you're sticking stuff through effects pedals. But um, actually, there's there's something kind of interesting. So one of my albums, Multiple Divisions, that is all digital and that is all done um, using two free programs. So one of them is called Sunvox, which is a really weird Russian, um, it's called like a tracker program and that's free and it runs on everything. It's very strange. Um, and then another one was, um, oh, the name's escaped me now. It's like a, a modular rack, VCV rack, I think it's called. And you, everyone can get that for free as well. So all of that album was done just basically using those two for the sounds. And then I think I dipped into my drum library. That blows me away, man. The quality. That must have been one of the biggest changes for you potentially anyways, is seeing the quality of the technology improve over the last 15 years. 100%. Uh, like, for instance, I don't think you could do rock music the way that you can do it now on computers, um, especially with drums and things. It was almost impossible to do that 10, 15 years ago to the, to the level you can do it now. I guess fakery is involved a lot of the time, but you can really fake a good rock album just using stuff for free online that you download. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, the end result is is what it is. And if it sounds good, it's good. The, the progression has been amazing in the last 15 years, especially. Well, yeah, I mean, like most people that you, you know, people who are uninitiated with the sound of a drum kit, for example, aren't necessarily going to be able to tell the difference between a V drum set and a drum kit if it, they're both put through some post-production, you know what I mean? You know, the they're just going to be like, oh, it's drums and they sound good. There, There's a hell of a lot of uh, bad drum sounds, I want to say, like um, stuff that sounds like MIDI effects from the 90s. I, I think that's the there's a hell of a lot of that. And, um, you know, you can't fault people for what they have and what they use, um, but there's a lot of kind of like tinny kind of... Uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's just like, it sounds like a 90s sound blaster trying to do drums, like <laughs> old school midis. Yeah, well, I mean, like, I, I suppose it almost gets to a point where like people are parodying that sound now, aren't they? Where you'll get people who deliberately kind of distort the sound of a really good sounding thing to make it more retro for the sake of doing like the kind of um, eccentric stuff. Uh, yeah, I guess it goes kind of back to that vaporwave stuff where a lot of that is kind of like cheesy kind of lounge music and then they're, they're trying to distort it so it sounds like it's a retro. It's sometimes they're trying to make it sound like it comes off a tape. I, I suppose at the end of the day, though, if something sounds good, it is good. It, you know, it doesn't matter how it was made at the end of the day, really. And, and there's a lot of people who, who get hung up on like, is this authentic? Is it not authentic? I think... The only aspects of authenticity that I really care about is I, I wouldn't pay for someone else's music to sing on top of it. Um, and there's like a few debates about that and it, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But I, I, that, that's not for me. I like making the music myself. Um, and then I've seen a hell of a lot of progression in rap music though. Like a lot of uh, my friends, I've got, there's a really cool guy called Glum Villains. Um, Glum Villains is really cool. He's from he's from somewhere in america but he makes amazing music and the progression of like i suppose rap sounds and like the production levels there like they're, they're phenomenal and anyone can make rap music that sounds amazing in terms of the production well yeah there's like all these different meta tuners that are out now the drum machines there's like 50 billion types of 808 but also you've got like this embrace of extended harmonies now in hip-hop and stuff which is really cool and just the fact that people can have their own studio at home and there's so many free resources to produce at home means that people have the best opportunity more than, you know, at this point in time that they've ever had to be able to produce amazing stuff. You're absolutely right. Yeah, there's so many things that you can do for free and it's worth exploring. You could get lost though. That's the other thing about the amount of freedom that you have to, to find different sounds and to make different sounds using, I guess, free software. It's it's an unbelievable amount. You could spend years just going through all the different things and trying all the different things. And um, I, know, I know a few people who, who like, I guess, gearhead friends, and they might be buying real things and using real things, but 
they get lost in that too. So they end up having all this equipment and then never making anything with it. Ooh. So that happens quite a lot as well. That's never fun, man. Like I, I, it's. Do you have any stuff that you're like that with, or are you pretty good about using all your equipment? Well, I've actually kind of kept things pretty minimal for a long time. Um, I just recently got something which is probably really stupid, but um, <laughs> I had to get it because it was it was so cheap. It's uh, an old karaoke machine of all things, um, and the reason why I got it was basically for the echo effect of it. So the prices of you know, real effects pedals and things, apart from like the Behringer range, which are like really cheap and also surprisingly good. I guess there's another question about like the morality of and ethics of like building something for that cheap. But anyway, I had to get this F echo, uh, this echo effect because it was for like 30 quid and it's this old school, horrible karaoke machine from like 2007. And it's it's got a television screen on it too. So you can, I, I guess it was for like, people in their bedrooms to scream along to like rubbish music but it's got this really bizarre echo thing and for 30 quid i couldn't say no but i've got it and i haven't really used it and it's huge and it's kind of annoying we we we, we were super hyped for it <laughs> we are hyped for it and then we got it and we're like oopsie <laughs> um yeah no I've, I've kind of kept my stuff minimal um apart from the synths and the effects pedals that i've got and I've, i'm using them so I'm not too, not too much of a hoarder. Good on you. Making the most of what you got, keeping it simple. Because your music doesn't sound simple. Like It blows my mind that you're able to get like a song done a day or that you have been getting a song done a day. I did that for a while. I did like, I, I tried to kind of challenge myself to like making a song every single day for a while. And I, I've slowed down a little bit in the last few years. It's, it's good and it's bad. You'll get a hell of a lot of rubbish stuff. But you can always go through that and then take samples out of that and then play around with those as well do you do any remixes of music from other people uh actually yeah so i only started really doing that in the last year or two um there's a band called liquid modern um they're a band in america and i remixed two of their songs together they wanted me to remix one song and i listened to two and i was like okay i can hear two things in each and i kind of want to meld them together so I did that. Um, I think it's called Walking Feet. And I think that's just on SoundCloud at the moment. But um, I think they might be putting that on Spotify or something soon. Oh, actually, no, you can get it on Bandcamp as well, I think. So Liquid Modern is the name of the band. Um, and I've done a few more. I've done some um, rap collaborations. I did one with the guy Glum Villain that I was talking about earlier on. But uh, I, I'd like to do more of that, actually. Collaborations are a really good way to sort of get your name spread around as an artist, eh? Like to get into new fan bases and such. For you as a musician in this day and age, how how do you get your name out there? How do you tell people about what you do? Well, until recently, I was using Twitter to do that. Um, and that worked out really well, um, surprisingly well. I was kind of always against using it, to be honest. That it never really appealed to me as a platform. And uh, I guess in this day and age, you kind of need to use a platform to get your music out there. It, unless you're doing live gigs, it's it's very, very hard to get noticed in any way. Um, you can't just put your music on a streaming platform and, and expect people to come and listen to it. So I went on Twitter and that worked. And I did get like quite a large, I suppose, quite a large following. I was like 1,300 odd people. Um, and then recently something weird happened where like there was a bit of drama some guy was like rallied against me for some reason it's all very silly and i was i was banned off the platform um i was reported a few times falsely for things and i have screenshots and it's a whole load of silly drama but uh so i might be back on that i might not <laughs> yeah because obviously i'm not going to dig too deep into that but that kind of blows my mind a little bit because, like, I thought Twitter was supposed to be, like, way more of a chill platform than some of the other social media websites that are out there. I don't know. There's been, like, a lot. I've seen a lot of arguments on the platform. Um, you know, I've, I guess I've been involved in some arguments against NFT people. And uh, I've seen some controversies and things. And it, the best thing that you can do really is to avoid it as much as possible but uh <laughs> with this situation basically I, I blocked one guy and he got annoyed about it and he told his followers which were like four thousand odd people to uh 
get me off there. So it worked. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. That's scary. Like, um, yeah, it's pretty weird. You know, as musicians, but as influencers, we 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 have these uh, people on these 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 websites with like par- sort of parasocial relationships with people and um, with their followers and stuff like that. And it's kind of wild that like someone can just feel affronted and then get their followers to get a person's account yeeted off of a platform. Yeah, I mean, well, so the strange thing about that is as well is that it happened twice. And so this is now the second time it's happened. And it's the same person. Um, it's, it's, it is strange that someone can hold that power. And it's strange that someone can, you know, they just decide that they, you know, they, they feel offended that you did not like them and that you blocked them. So they decide to try and retaliate. Um, it's all very childish. And, and this man who's doing this is in his 40s. And I'm just like, this is just ridiculous. You know, should I even fight this? Uh, you know, do I want to be involved with that? So... I think I'm just going to take a step back for a while, to be honest, because it's just pathetic. Yeah, I mean, like, if we look at it, like, from the perspective of what Twitter is doing to cope with this, it's just not really doing anything. I assume it's bots making the decision. It's like, oh, Some there's... Of it is, yeah. Yeah, because, like, I think that someone... Like, if Twitter cared about the people that were on its platform, or if it had the resources to care, right? If it had the resources to care, it would probably be looking at your situation and going, okay, why is this person, <laughs> you know, why is this person being reported despite, you know, you think they're trying to get both sides of the situation? I suppose they have a massive platform with so many different people that they have to deal with. I can see how it's very hard to police that. But I've seen things on there where it's like, how is this person still here when they're putting this up? You know, like real horrible things. And then they'll get away with it. And then there's other people who do really very mild, like, you know, small arguments and they'll be banned off the thing or they'll be suspended. And uh, I think some of it is bots, you know, if you, for instance, if you put the wrong song lyric up, you might be banned. Um, I, I know of someone who put a thing up uh, to do with, say, um, I think it was Radiohead, Burn the Witch. And the term Burn the Witch was flagged and they got suspended for that. So, yeah, no, it, it Twitter seems like a dumpster fire. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> so where, where are you okay so you're going to take a step back from twitter because man people need to know about what you're doing man with this um with not only your music but also the band Cam friday stuff because you're doing something that's really cool where are you going to go outside of twitter well i've been kind of exploring reddit but that seems kind of uh it seems kind of hard to get into that from my perspective so i've been looking on reddit um i'm not a big fan of facebook i deleted my own like personal one like maybe a year ago and i haven't missed it at all like that thing is a waste of time i don't want to see holiday pictures from people i went to school with um, <laughs> you know i hope they have a good holiday but i just don't, don't want to see it <laughs> um there's all there's all kinds of things i don't know all kinds of places there's i'm, I'm looking at some weird ones um it's like uh i guess i think there's like quite a few chinese ones but I have no idea what the what the demographics are. I guess of those things, I don't know who I can speak to on those things. The the Chinese ones like Billy Billy. Let me tell you, my dude. I'll keep this very brief. Don't fucking do it. Don't go near Billy Billy or any of those websites. Don't do it. I built up a platform with around one hundred and twenty five thousand people. I got there in a, less than a month, and they said to me that they didn't have a contract for international clients, but they would sort one. And I waited months. I have the award for the 100K up there on the thing as proof of that. Billy Billy, the website I'm talking about, because I can talk about this now because I'm, I'm leaving the platform. I'll have left, I've, I've left the platform as of the, the day we're recording this. They said they pay and then they they owed me like a, a, probably like a few thousand dollars or at least like a thousand dollars. I don't know what the hell it was after the tax rate, which may not sound like much, but they pay 15 cents per thousand views. Okay, that's a hell of a lot. That's a lot of views. Yeah, for 15 cents, YouTube pays $3. You know, you'd be needing to have a massive channel of around 300 to 500K to be able to get to a point where you can make maybe 20K. Well, I don't know the currency where you're at. What's the currency? 
uh, euro. Yeah. So yeah, so about twenty k euro, you need a channel of about three to hundred to five hundred k, and that's if they pay you. I had to threaten the the website. I had to threaten the website with leaving before they'd actually give me a contract, and they told me that I needed to send them my passport on top of the ID that I'd already sent to an account outside of the website and that I wouldn't actually get paid for any further videos that I posted on a channel after they promised that I'd get paid for repeated payments. No one wants to pay anyone, it seems. <laughs> well, I mean, Billy Billy will pay you if you go to a multi Chinese multinational or an MCN. Um, they'll pay you if you are in South Africa because well, because of Ali, Alipay. But you're going to have a real tough time if you try and go the route I took. And I had people begging me to join the website. I'm basically leaving 100,000 people behind by moving back to YouTube. You're, you, if you join one of these, these websites, like obviously go for it, man. But if you join them, you've got to be very sure that you've got to have contractual proof that they're going to pay you. Because like if I took the 5 million views that I had in three months off of Billy Billy and converted that to YouTube, that would have been $15,000 in three months. Yep, and not a cent. So I wouldn't recommend it, man. Sorry, I'm not trying to make this interview about me or anything. It's just a warning I'm going to give to anyone who, th who considers it because no. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. I, I, I had no idea really. Um... And I'm still, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the best platform is to use that is not Twitter. Twitter worked about really well for me. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of in the air at the moment, but, um, you know, it's, it's fine. It is what it is. And uh, it'll work out in the end. I mean, like you great, you made great music to begin with. Honestly, like you'd probably find some success with Reddit. Like, uh, would you be interested in doing like video content via YouTube or something like that? I've done a few, I've done a few like, I guess just music videos. Um, I don't know how I feel about like being a streamer. I don't think I don't think it would suit me. I'm not a big fan of that. You know, I I I think it takes massive balls to be honest to to go and put yourself out there and there's a level of exposure there which uh, I guess I'd kind of feel uncomfortable about in in some ways. But I think it's it's great that people can do it. It's a, it's an amazing strange thing that's only developed in the last like what again 15 20 years. Before that, you know, your best hope was that you could get on radio or on television. And uh, this whole, all this technology has opened up so many different possibilities for people. And I think like, what was it last year? They did uh, interviews with kids in America. And, you know, number one job that kids used to want to do was like an astronaut or a fireman or something or a doctor or, or you know, and now they all want to be streamers. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. but Being a streamer, um, it's, I totally get why you don't want to do it. Like if you don't feel comfortable in front of a camera, that's totally dope, man. That's totally fine. There's no shame in that. If you want to have privacy, I mean, I think, well, first of all, I mean, Billy Billy already have my ID. They don't have my passport because I didn't give that to them, but they have my ID. If there was some data leak or something, people would know a lot of information about me. The, I'm, I'm not very open about who I am in my live streams and I, deliberately keep it kind of sort of subtle but i think for someone like yourself who really values your privacy it might be best i mean this sounds really stupid but have you seen those people that make those vtuber avatars i've seen some of the live streams where it's like uh you know they're playing um grand theft auto or something and they've got like a little puppet guy on the side like a little frog or something i don't know i've seen them um it's it's odd <laughs> <laughs> it is odd because people are like realizing that streaming is really intrusive and they're trying to like make it so they don't show themselves. And I think they you're onto it. Like with social media, I think people put, put a lot of themselves out there and you're just trying to keep some sense of privacy to your life, aren't you? A little bit, a tiny bit, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't mind too much, but it, it's kind of like I'd, I'd rather me as the musician be separate to like, you know, my work as a photographer later on or... I'd like to kind of keep things separate in that way. So yeah, I, I guess we're also living in a strange time where like, you know, all those revelations came out in 2013 about Edward Snowden and how like you've got the NSA and everyone looking through our webcams and all that stuff. And uh, a lot of people still don't think about that. And that's still going on. <laughs> and, you know, the world is becoming harder. It's still, still harder to becoming, you know, it's harder to be 
I guess, insular. If you're putting yourself out in any way or putting work out, it, it's hard to kind of remain anonymous in a certain to a certain degree. And, you know, back before all of this crazy internet stuff that we're living through now, a music, a music, a music, oh, excuse me, <laughs> a musician was kind of um, a mysterious person. You didn't know everything about them. You know, you might see what you read in the newspapers or Keith Moon throwing things out of windows and Jimi Hendrix going crazy. You might see all unusual things, but it was more mysterious and it was more interesting. And I kind of, I think that's a better way to be as a musician. I don't think everyone should know every single thing about your life. Because then it's not surprising anymore, is it? No. no. Because like, if you just get handed everything, then you're just constantly being fed a content stream like a, like a baby bird. <laughs> and um, then also you get the sense of entitlement from people where they're like, but, but you owe me. Because you usually do all this stuff and then you're not doing it. Don't you like us anymore, etc. You also have to be really careful as well, I think, now in, in terms of like putting your foot in your mouth. If you say the wrong thing, it can just ruin your career or it can, I guess, damage your your music integrity and uh, or anything in terms of art or anything. Anyone, to be honest, can... You know, there's been whole lives ruined over sentences they said when they were like 17 or 18 years old. And, and that's strange. That is a strange thing. Yeah, that's, um, I think for you and I, who uh, didn't get into social media when we were like in our tweens, you know, 12 or 13 or some kind of garbage, I think we are lucky for that. Because there are, I mean, there's there's kids that have YouTube channels worth like, uh, like tens of not hundreds of millions, t- tens of millions of dollars. And their entire life is on on YouTube now. Which is why I kind of respect you because you're just trying to keep it simple and just trying to have that sense of mystery about you. I guess I've I've seen a lot of those uh, streamers as well. And in a way, I feel sorry for them. I've seen, I saw a thing recently. There was one guy, he was a YouTube streamer, a gamer. And it was like pretty big news on YouTube. Basically, he live streamed a breakdown and he never recovered from that. And, you know, there's elements of, of darkness to do with a lot of this technology where if, if you if you use it the wrong way or if you're having a bad time in your life and you're under pressure to like meet these quotas of views and make people happy all the time i can see how that can be really damaging to someone this is this is a very dark interview by the way i'm sorry i think <laughs> oh no don't feel bad at all man um oh these interviews we i end up getting into all sorts of stuff with people just because like i think if i was to try and do a 10 question interview you know, you can always miss something, right? You mm. might not ask that critical 11th question. I suppose for you though, like, do you f- do you feel like the this stuff with the sort of dystopian nature stuff is what's feeding your music now and for future releases? Um, there's definitely, definitely an aspect of dystopia going through a lot of my music and with the weird way that the world has gone in the last year or two, especially with like, you got the pandemic and you have, everything that's going on with Russia and the Ukraine. It's uh, it's definitely probably feeding into it. Um, whether or not, I mean, at the same time, my music was always a little bit dark. So I'm not sure if that aspect of darkness and kind of dystopia was already there, but maybe it's being intensified from the situation that's going on now. I know that it's getting late for you, so I don't want to keep you too much longer, but like, have you got, I mean, you've already released Logic Collapses this year. Have you got much more music planned for future? I'm probably going to release another album this year. Um, I'm already working on stuff still constantly. Um, So there will be something else coming out this year. And I'm kind of debating whether or not to stick it on Spotify now. Um, That's kind of my main. Should I keep doing that or should I just focus on Bandcamp? So because to be honest, like Spotify doesn't really... Not that I'm after profit or anything, but I haven't noticed Spotify really doing anything for me. And maybe that's because I'm not really pushing it much. I, I think that a big there's a big battle in my head about how you promote stuff and like how much time is that worth? Do I just want to keep making stuff or do I want to use the time to try and promote it? And I, I think that's a big battle between a lot of musicians in their heads. You're absolutely right. Where is that equilibrium? 
that sense of balance between the work put in to promote on top of the creating it and the, the reward from putting it out there. I totally get what you mean. I talk about it with the music students that I work with because they're like, I want to have a career in music, but I've heard that like you need to get X amount of plays on Spotify per 100 views, you know, per, 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 you know, 325 plays per dollar or something like that. And that's if you're in Spotify's good books. But I think that if you stay on Bandcamp, that's just kind of consistent with your branding at this point, isn't it? Yeah, I've I've got quite a bit of success with Bandcamp. Um, And, you know, it's, I haven't made any money really for it from it myself um, because I've been giving it all away and most of the sales will happen on Bandcamp Fridays. But uh, I'm still happy to do that, you know. I'm lucky to be in a position where I can do that for at least probably another year. Which is awesome. And look, I genuinely hope you can find a place, maybe Twitter will even stop being tits. <laughs> maybe Twitter will stop <laughs> being feeling, annoying. I have a feeling that the decision will be overturned, but... Um, I think I've been put off it for a little while, but uh, I'll, I might return to it later on. Because, like, if I mean, it's it's a bit broken at the moment, but before the the BS occurred, if it wasn't broken, we don't really need to fix it, eh? Exactly. Yeah. Limnetic villains. Is there anything else I've missed today in this interview? Is there anything else you wanted to chat about? Uh, I guess I want to say I hope I didn't depress all the viewers and listeners who, <laughs> you know, the world's not all bad. It's not all dystopian. There are some lovely things happening in the world. There's some great musicians and bands. Uh, check out the Super Fairy Animals. They're a fantastic band. Um, check out a guy called Tom Beck. He's really good. His first few albums are really, really fantastic. There's good stuff everywhere all the time. There's great art being made. There's amazing people and there's good things in the world. So, you know, enjoy, enjoy life. Yeah, I, I think that if people were depressed after watching this interview, especially from what you've been talking about, I think they're missing the point. What you've been talking about, there's been some frustration with certain elements like with Twitter and stuff. But basically, you're showcasing your achievements as a musician and your virtue as a human being with what you're doing with your music. Like speaking your truth, you know, like the Bandcamp Fridays, um, donations, etc. You're doing, I think, what... And you've mentioned other musicians do it, of course. But what you guys are doing is actually literally for the better, betterment of humanity. And we really appreciate you doing what you do. So thank you for your music and your efforts. Limnetic Villains. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it was love. Oh, wait, oh, wait, before we go, so people can find you on Bandcamp. Is there anywhere else where people can find you at the moment? I am on all the other platforms in terms of the streaming sites. Uh, Bandcamp is probably the best place, though. Uh, but not Facebook, because we don't like the Zuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all good, man. Hey, look, Limnetic Villains, you have a great day. Thank you very much for your time. Sleep well, and I'll catch you around, okay? Cheers, man. Thank you very much. See ya. Bye-bye. And that was my interview with Limnetic Villains. It was a longer one, but I had a great time. Um, I think the camera cut out midway, so I'm probably going to have to figure out what to do at that point but thank you for watching this interview with Lynetic Villains the guy is a star working on music for over half his life signed to a record label at 15 it's wild man it's really cool to be chatting to someone who's accomplished so much and has seen the industry change and, and I really appreciate his love for synths and pedals um, please do go check out his band camp as well as his other various social medias uh, stay cool and stay safe and please also remember to support your local musicians and artists at this point in time as either hell more than ever with all the crazy stuff going on in the world and I'll catch you in the next SP interviews. Spider hands out.